Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about phonetics, the first level of linguistic analysis that we're going to be covering in detail. So we covered the basics. Now we're ready to move up a step on the ladder to phonetics. This is the lowest level of linguistic analysis, looking at the most low level features of language the very basic elements of the sounds that we use. So I'd like to just illustrate to you with a video here what phonetics is really all about. This is going to be a video of someone talking. It's someone who's standing like this and they are in an MRI so you can see sort of a cross section of their head as they're talking. And as this person's talking, you'll see that he's moving his lips, his tongue, and some other stuff. Just take a look at this. This is what it looks like when you talk. This is what you are doing when you're talking. So he's swallowing, and he's going to start talking. Here we go. This looks weird, doesn't it? It looks quite strange. Again, remember that in language, we have an unconscious mastery of an incredibly complex skill. In this case, part of the skill is that you can talk. You know how to move the articulators in your mouth, your lips, your tongue, your uvula, your throat. You know how to move them in this incredibly intricate, complex, patterned way in order to express thoughts. And what we're going to be talking about in this section of the class in phonetics is what exactly is going on here. What are the parts? How are they moving? How do they produce the sounds of language? So think about how amazing this is, how complicated this is. Your brain is somehow calculating a meaning that it wants to express. Then it somehow calculates a series of muscle movements in your mouth in order to produce sounds which express those meanings to some other person. It's an incredibly complex process. Another interesting aspect here is that when you look at this, None of this anatomy, none of the stuff here in your mouth actually evolved for language. All of this stuff evolved just for the usual stuff you use your mouth for, for like chewing and eating and swallowing and all these kinds of things. The actual anatomy here in the human mouth is identical to the anatomy in our closest evolutionary relatives, chimps and bonobos and other creatures like that. So this anatomy did not evolve for language but it has been adopted, it's been co-opted to be used in order to produce language in humans. Also, during this part of the class, I'm going to be demonstrating different sounds to you and we're going to be talking about how you're moving your articulators to produce those sounds. I would like you, during these lectures, to talk out loud, repeat along with me, say things out loud, and feel, feel what your mouth is doing and what your other parts of your vocal apparatus are doing as we are talking. And also, as you're talking to other people, when you're talking to friends outside of this class, during the weeks that we're studying phonetics, just pay a little bit of attention to what is going on in your mouth as you're talking. If you're really paying attention in this part of the class, then there's going to be a period of maybe two or three weeks where it feels really strange. It's going to feel really strange to talk because the exact motions you're going to be doing, which previously were part of what you knew how to do only unconsciously, are going to be exposed to your conscious awareness. So just try it out. It's really very interesting and fun. So let's get to it. There are two kinds of phonetics that you might study. Remember, phonetics is the study of the sounds involved in language. There's articulatory phonetics. Articulatory phonetics consists of the study of how we actually produce sounds using our vocal apparatus, using our articulators, and so on. The other kind of phonetics which you could study is what's called acoustic phonetics. This is the properties of the sounds that are produced. Things like the frequencies and amplitudes of the waveforms of the sounds that are produced when you talk. In this class, we're going to focus almost entirely on articulatory phonetics. That is, how you actually move your vocal apparatus to produce these sounds. And so we're going to be talking quite a bit about the anatomy 
of your vocal tract. So this first part of the class is going to be like an anatomy class in med school or something, except we're going to be focusing on your vocal tract and the parts of it and how they're used during the production of speech. Here is the vocal tract. This is another MRI, MRI scan like the one in the video that I showed you, except now it's static. And I've pointed out two of the major parts of your vocal apparatus. There's the lower part called the larynx. That's what is also sometimes called your voice box or your vocal folds. The larynx is the thing which is here. You should feel it here. And I'd like you to just put your hand on your larynx or over your larynx on your neck and feel how it's vibrating when you're talking. Basically, the way that speech production works is that your larynx has some folds in it. They constrict. Air comes through the, those folds from your lungs, and it creates a vibration. It creates a buzzing sound. So speech production consists of using your larynx here to create a buzzing sound. And then this step above, above the larynx, your vocal tract, this is going to move around and constrict that airflow in certain various ways in order to modify that buzzing sound. And that creates all the sounds of natural language. It's a buzzing sound from the larynx, which is then modified by various actions that you take within your vocal tract, the vocal tract consisting of your tongue and your mouth and your nasal cavity. So the two basic components for speech production are the larynx and the vocal tract. They operate in tandem. The larynx is, can be divided into these various little parts. The important part is the vocal cords or the vocal folds. This is the thing that contracts. It becomes tight in order to create vibration when air is flowing through. And here are pictures of the two major states of your vocal folds during speech. So they can either be closed or open. Closed means that they are constricted, and when the air flows through them, it's going to create a vibration. It's going to create that buzzing sound. The other major state of the vocal folds is that they are open. This is when you're breathing. Just imagine, so hold your hand next to your glottis, next to your vocal folds, and just breathe. You see, that feels different than when you're talking. There's not that buzzing. When you're breathing, your vocal folds are open. And when you're talking, actually, most of the time your vocal folds are closed, creating that vibration, but also sometimes they're open. During the enunciation of certain kinds of sounds, your vocal folds are open, which enables that free flow of air without friction, without vibration, through the vocal folds. So that's the larynx. The larynx is fairly simple. It, to a first approximation, it has two states, closed and open. When it's closed, it's vibrating. When it's open, the air is coming through. Sometimes you will have other sort of intermediate states that are used to articulate certain kinds of sounds and language, which we'll talk about later in the class, but we're just doing the basic sounds right now. And for the basic sounds, the two states of the larynx are open and closed. Now let's talk about the vocal tract. This is the stuff above the larynx. The vocal tract has in it a bunch of things called articulators. Articulators are a part of the vocal anatomy which can move to filter the air that's coming through the larynx to produce all the sounds of a language. So you have the air coming up through the larynx, you have your vocal tract, your tongue and lips and so on, they're moving around to filter that air and create all kinds of interesting sounds. So what are those articulators? The major articulators inside the vocal tract are these. I'll step through them. We'll start from the front of your mouth with the lips and we'll go back down into the throat. First major set of articulators is your lips. You use your lips to make sounds like the sounds indicated by the English letters P and B. We're going to be thinking about which different sounds in language are produced by which different articulators. The lips are used to produce sounds like P, B, M, and so on. Next major set of articulators is your teeth. When you say a word like teeth, feel what your tongue is doing when you say teeth. At the very end of the word, the tip of your tongue is touching your teeth. Also, when you say something with an F in it, like the word far or father, 
you'll feel that your bottom lip is touching your top teeth. So your teeth are involved in that blockage of airflow which produces sounds. Your teeth are articulators. Next major articulator is the, uh, the, uh, what's called the alveolar ridge. So to, to feel the alveolar ridge, you should put your tongue on your teeth, like as if you're saying teeth, and slowly move your tongue back. As you slowly move your tongue back, you'll feel a bit of a ridge, a little bit of a bump there. That's the alveolar ridge. It's quite hard. That's the alveolar ridge. You use the alveolar ridge to produce sounds like ta, da, sa, things like that. Next major articulator is what's called the hard palate. So if you keep moving your tongue back, keep moving the tongue along the top of your mouth backwards from the alveolar ridge, keep going, you'll go into a sort of valley where it stays hard, the surface is still hard. This is what's called the hard palate. And it keeps going back. If you move your tongue even further back, really try to twist your tongue as back, back as far as your mouth as you can while still touching the top of your mouth, you'll feel that that hard palate becomes somewhat soft. It gets somewhat soft, it turns into something called the soft palate, which or the velum. The velum is behind the hard palate and it goes up to the uvula which is the next articulator. The uvula is the little thing that dangles down in the back of your mouth. The uvula is not used as an articulator in English. It's not used in English, so you might not think about it as something which is usually used to produce sounds, but we'll see that there are other languages with other sounds which do use the uvula as an articulator. Then going back down into the throat, there's a bit of a passage between the uvula and the larynx very at the bottom there and that is what's called the pharynx. And then the glottis at the very bottom is the actual vocal folds themselves. So these are the articulators. And the various ways in which you move your tongue to sort of bounce off of these articulators or to press against them, these are called articulatory gestures. So let's think about the different sounds that are produced by the different articulators and the different articulatory gestures. Sounds like the sounds indicated by the English letters P, B, and M. If you feel what your mouth is doing when you say P, B, M, it involves both lips. These are called bilabial consonants. Similarly, sounds like F and V, Fa, Va, you'll feel that those involve the teeth touching your lips, so they're labiodental. Sounds like tha, tha in English are dental. They involve your tongue against your teeth. Sounds like ta, da, sa, za. Those are alveolar, involving the alveolar ridge there. Sounds like cha, ja, and sha are just a little bit back in that other place of articulation along your alveolar ridge. Sounds like ka and ga are velar. They involve the back of your tongue moving up to touch that soft palate. Sounds like na, ma, they're nasal sounds, which we'll talk about in a second. But let's think a bit about those sounds g, k, k and g in English. I'd like you to just produce those and feel what your tongue is doing when you say ka or ga. It's the back of your tongue which is moving. It's moving up to touch the velum, the soft palate, that soft area in the back of the roof of your mouth. Ka, ga. Compare that with something like ta, da involving the tip of your tongue against the alveolar ridge. So I hope you're starting to really feel the differences between these places of articulation and the different motions involved in these, in these articulations. So these sounds, these consonant sounds, p, b, m, these are what we call phones. A phone is a distinct, discrete speech sound. Phone does not mean a letter. A letter is an aspect of the English writing system, and we're not thinking about English now as a written language. We're thinking about it as a auditory vocal spoken language. So we're thinking about the units of sound as they are pronounced. The units of sound here are things like p, b, m, and so on, which I'm indicating here with English letters, just as we are getting used to this idea of phonetics. We'll see that pretty soon 
representing these sounds using the English spelling system is not going to be sufficient. We're going to have to actually introduce a new alphabet called the International Phonetic Alphabet, which enables us to precisely represent these phones, these speech sounds. So we can take the English consonants and arrange them in a nice table like this. This table indicates the kinds of articulators that are involved in these English consonants. So we have the bilabial sounds like p, b, and m. We have the labiodental sounds like f and v. I've arranged all the sounds here. The columns indicate the place of articulation going from the front of the mouth, the lips, down to the back, as far as it goes in English, the velum, the velar sounds. Well, I've arranged them by place of articulation. Place of articulation is a technical term in phonetics which indicates which articulators are involved in producing the sound. Bilabial just means that the sound is produced via some motion of the two lips. Postalveolar means that the sound is produced via some motion involving the area behind the alveolar ridge. And Again, I said that just notating these sounds using English spelling is not really going to be sufficient. We want to replace this notion of English letters with a more precise way of writing sounds. We're going to introduce phonetic symbols. We want to introduce a special alphabet in which one symbol corresponds to one sound. So notice that English is not like that. So the sound indicated by the English letters th in the dental column there. That's the sound tha or the as in thigh or thy or this. That sound th, that's just one sound. It doesn't consist of a t followed by a h, right? So that's just one sound. It happens to be written with two letters in English. So that's maybe a little bit um, not ideal. If we want a fully systematic way of writing down sounds, we want one symbol to correspond to one phone. Another issue with the English spelling system here is that the spelling th actually represents two different kinds of sound. So think about a word like thigh and a word like thy. Those are different sounds, but they're both written with a th. So what's the difference between those sounds? Actually, you can put your hand again to your vocal folds and say the two words thigh and thy, you'll feel that your vocal folds are vibrating when you say thy, but not when you say thigh. So those are two separate different sounds. They're written in the same way in English. So we want to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between phonetic symbols and sounds. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to introduce new symbols to indicate these sounds, which are only represented by these ambiguous pairs of letters in English. So for the th, we're going to use this Greek letter theta to indicate the sound th as in thigh. And we're going to use the D with a line through it, which is called an ev. We're going to use the ev symbol to represent the sound of thy or this, the voiced sound, the voiced dental. And similarly, in the post alveolar column, the sound sh um, really corresponds to two different sounds. So there's the sound sh and the sound j, as in where a word like pleasure, the j sound in pleasure is not the same as the sh sound in shake. So those are two separate sounds. We should indicate them with two separate symbols. So we indicate the sh sound with this long s, and we indicate the j sound with the weird z here in the post alveolar column. So we're going to be writing sounds not using the English writing system, we're going to be writing them using these symbols in which one symbol corresponds to one distinct kind of sound. This is the International Phonetic Alphabet. And the phonetics part of this class is really going to be structured around this alphabet about learning how this alphabet is organized. You're going to learn how to pronounce all the different sounds in the International Phonetic Alphabet, including a lot of sounds that are going to be unfamiliar to you, that are not in any language that you currently speak. So this is a phonetic symbol. A phonetic symbol is one symbol, one sound. And phonetic symbols can be organized into a chart like this, where you can look at the chart and you can say, well, that theta symbol, the th, I know that's dental because it's in that column of the chart. The chart also is arranged not only by place of articulation, 
but also something called manner of articulation. So manner of articulation indicates how the articulators are moving when you produce a sound. Remember, place of articulation just says which articulator is involved. Manner of articulation tells you what is that articulator actually doing? And there's different things that they do. So the first row here, the sounds p, b, t, d, k, g, these are what we call stop consonants. The manner of articulation for these things is stop, or it's also called a plosive consonant. So a stop consonant works by moving the articulator to its position such that you create a total blockage of airflow. So just say ata very slowly, ata. You can feel that first you're saying a, ah, then the tip of your tongue moves up to your alveolar ridge, at, and then there's a bit of a stoppage. Then you get a bit of a buildup of air behind your tongue. So you've completely stopped up the airflow and you're creating this increasing pressure behind your articulator there. And then you release it, at, ta. So you let the pressure build up, then you release the air suddenly. So that's called a stop consonant. A stop consonant means you use your articulator to completely block the airflow, you get a bit of buildup of air, and then you let it out suddenly. The next major place of articulate or manner of articulation, rather, for consonants is nasal. A nasal consonant is produced by redirecting your airflow from going through your mouth to rather going through your nose. So these are the sounds like ma and na and some other sounds that we haven't gotten to yet, which I'll teach you about. So ma, na, you can tell that air is flowing through your nose rather than through your mouth when you say these by holding your fingers on your nose. When you say ma, na, you'll feel vibration inside your nose as you're saying ma, but not when you're saying something like da or ka, right? So these are nasal consonants. They're produced by redirecting the airflow through your nose instead of through your mouth. The last major manner of articulation, these are what are called the obstruent manners of articulation, is fricative. Fricative means that you produce a consonant by moving your articulator to create a partial blockage in your vocal tract. So you're not totally walling off the air, you're just creating a partial blockage so that the air can flow through the partial blockage and create friction. It creates a continuous sort of frictiony sound. So technically we say that it's continuous turbulent airflow with friction through the mouth. So these are going to be your sounds like fa, va, tha, la, and sa, za. Notice that these are sounds that you can sort of stretch out indefinitely. So you can say s for a very long time. You can just continually let that friction happen. The air is flowing between the tip of your tongue and your alveolar ridge, creating friction. You can create that sound continuously. That's a fricative. It's different than a stop. Remember, in a stop, you create total blockage and airflow builds up. You say, when you say something like ta, you can't stretch out the T sound forever. Ta. The T is, it only happens in one moment in time when that airflow pops out. Rather, in the other case, uh, for a fricative, you can continue the sound indefinitely because you have this continuous airflow with friction through the constriction which is created by your articulators. So we say that, for example, the sound V, which is spelled with the symbol V in the International Phonetic Alphabet, that is what we call a labiodental fricative. That means the place of articulation is labiodental and involves the tongue and the teeth, and the, it involves rather the lips and the teeth. And the manner of articulation is fricative, so it involves this friction, this continuous sound, fa va. The other major dimension on which consonant sounds vary is what's called voicing. Voicing indicates the state of the vocal cords during the production of a sound. A voiced consonant means that the vocal cords are closed and vibrating while a sound is being produced. An unvoiced sound means that the vocal cords are open while a sound is being produced. So in order to perceive the difference between the voiced and the unvoiced sounds, I'd like you to again put your hand to your larynx 
and feel whether your vocal cords are vibrating when you are enunciating a particular consonant. So we'll say pa, a, pa, and ba, a, ba, the bilabial stops. Notice that when you're saying a, pa, while you're producing the p sound, your vocal cords stop vibrating, a, pa. So they're vibrating as you say a, they stop vibrating as you say p, and then they continue vibrating again once you're saying a, a, pa. But when you say the b, the other bilabial stop, a, ba, a, ba, a, ba, you can feel that your vocal cords are continuing to vibrate throughout the sound. So many sounds in many languages come in these sort of pairs. There's an unvoiced form like p, and there's a voiced form like b. And in this chart, and in the International Phonetic Alphabet chart, we always indicate consonants in pairs. The form on the left is the unvoiced form, and the form on the right is the voiced form. So p, b, t, d, k, g, these are pairs of unvoiced and voiced consonants. So given this chart, you can actually completely describe any sound by giving three pieces of information. You have to give the place of articulation, the manner of articulation, and the voicing. So for example, the sound z, spelled by the letter z there, that is a voiced alveolar fricative. You can tell it's voiced because your vocal cords are vibrating when you say z. You can tell it's alveolar because the tip of your tongue is touching your alveolar ridge. You can tell it's a fricative because it has friction and it can be extended in time, zzz, and so on. It doesn't involve stoppage, like in a stop consonant. So those are the voiced consonants. Those are the unvoiced consonants. So let's practice analyzing English consonants a bit. So I'm going to indicate certain consonants on the chart, and I'd like you to figure out what are the features. How would I describe the articulation of that consonant in terms of its articulatory features, its place of articulation, its manner of articulation, and its voicing? That means you have to specify these three dimensions voicing, place, and manner. And you usually specify them by convention in that order. So you say something like a voiced bilabial stop. You give the voicing and then the manner of articulation then the place. Uh, no, rather you give the voicing and then the place of articulation and then the manner. So what is this? The thing that is spelled by the International Phonetic Alphabet symbol T. What is this? Well, first you ask, is it voiced or unvoiced? Let's see. Ta, ta, is your vocal cord vibrating when you say t, ta, t? No, it's not. So it's unvoiced. And is it, what is its um, place of articulation? You can read that off the chart or you can feel it in your mouth. It involves the tip of your tongue on the alveolar ridge, t. And what is the manner of articulation? Is there complete stoppage, or is there this incomplete stoppage with friction, or is it nasal? Well, let's see if it's nasal. T -t -t -t. I don't feel my nose vibrating, so it's not a nasal consonant. Does it involve complete stoppage? T. It feels like it does. A ta. So that is an unvoiced alveolar stop. That's how you would scientifically describe the sound t. Another example, the sound m. Well, let's think. First of all, is it voiced or unvoiced? So let's say ma, ma, it's voiced. Then is it nasal? Ma, yes, it's nasal. And what is its uh, manner of articulation? Well, it is nasal. And what are the, what's the place of articulation involved? Ma, you can even see it. Ma, it involves the two lips. So it is a voiced bilabial nasal. And this thing, this is a symbol you're maybe not familiar with, the long S. This is, the symbol is also read as esh. So what does esh indicate? Shh. Well, you can hear that there's friction involved, so it must be some kind of fricative. Shh. Shh. You can feel that your vocal cords are not vibrating, so it's unvoiced. Shh. And the place of articulation, Shh. right behind that alveolar ridge. 
so it is an unvoiced postalveolar fricative. So those are just some of the English consonants. There's more English consonants that I'm going to show you soon. Other languages involve different places of articulation, even different manners of articulation, even different forms of voicing. Here now is the complete chart of consonants for all languages, the International Phonetic Alphabet for Consonants. Actually, this is just a subset of the consonants. This is the consonants which are produced using air which is flowing out of the lungs. Some other languages involve consonants that are produced in other ways, for example, click sounds that don't involve air coming out of the lungs. But this right here is all the symbols for all the possible consonants that are produced using air that comes out of the lungs. So let's go through it. What we're gonna do now is expand your phonetic horizon by looking at some sounds. We're gonna go through most of these sounds, talk about what languages they're used in, how they're produced. I'd like you to try to pronounce these things. So I can pronounce most of these. I'll give you examples and I'll describe what you should do with your articulators. And I'd like you to follow along and just try to pronounce these things and you will gain the ability to appreciate other languages in a new way. So first we're gonna go through the row of stops, stop consonants, which are also called plosive consonants. Stop, remember, is a manner of articulation. We're gonna go through the different places of articulation for stops. So these are the major stop consonants across languages. Stop consonant, remember, is formed by totally obstructing the airflow and then releasing it. So you use your lips or your tongue or your uvula, whatever, to block the airflow completely. You let it build up, you release it, it creates a little burst, and that's a stop consonant. First major kind of stop consonant is the bilabial stops, the sounds like pa and ba which you're quite familiar with. Almost all languages have these sounds. There are some languages that don't have these sounds. In fact, there's some languages that don't have any bilabial sounds whatsoever, interestingly. But most languages do have these sounds. Bilabial stops, pa and ba. The next step back would be your alveolar stops, your sounds like ta and da. Again, these are very common sounds across languages. Next up, we're gonna to get to some sounds that we don't have in English. So the retroflex stops. Retroflex consonants are produced by taking the tip of your tongue and touching it to the hard palate. That's the middle part of the top of your mouth in this figure. So you basically curl your tongue backwards in your mouth. Curl your tongue backwards, touch the tip to top of the mouth, and make a consonant sound. You get pa. Pa, pa. That's a retroflex stop, an unvoiced retroflex stop. So you obstruct the airflow by curling the tip of the tongue back to the hard palate. Pa. This is most common, this sound is most frequently found in the languages of the Indian subcontinent. For example, in Hindi, there's this word tuta. It involves two retroflex stop consonants. The sound tuta means something different then the sound tuta with a regular alveolar stop instead of a retroflex stop. So that's an example of a retroflex consonant, something we don't have in English, but it's not rare across languages. There are plenty of languages that have retroflex stops, like ka. Then this next set of consonants is another one which might be a little bit exotic to you. This, these are what are called palatal stops. A palatal stop is formed by touching the front of the tongue, that sort of middle range there, moving it directly up to touch the hard palate and creating a stop. So you just sort of move your tongue straight up and make a stop. Ka, what you get is ka, ka, ka. It sounds a little bit like cha to an English speaker, but it's, it's different. So you have ka and the voiced version of that consonant would be ga. So an example of a language that has this sound and uses it quite a bit would be Hungarian, European language Hungarian. The word magyar in Hungarian, it means Hungarian in Hungarian, that word involves a palatal stop. 
the, which is spelled with a G-Y in the Hungarian writing system. But the phonetic symbol is this weird sort of J. So that's magyar, gy or t t t Those are your palatal stops. These retroflexes and palatals are maybe new. They're interesting. Now, velar stops are something which nearly every language has, again, and you're familiar with them from English. So these are the sounds that are created by touching the back of the tongue up to the soft palate, or the velum. That's why they're called velar, because they involve the velum, which is the soft palate. These are your sounds like ka, ga. You can feel that the back of your tongue is moving up to your velum when you say these things. Uvular stops are produced going even farther back. So a uvular stop is produced by moving the very back of your tongue backwards to touch your uvula, which is back behind your velum. So English does not have these kinds of sounds. I'll show you what it sounds like. I have to drink some water before trying this. So these are sounds like ka, ga. That's the unvoiced form, then the voiced form. So ka. So kamara is the Arabic word for moon involving an unvoiced uvular stop. And this is spelled in the Arabic language using the letter qaf, spelled Q-A-F in English. The letter Q actually originally indicated this kind of uvular stop sound. And then when it was adopted into the Latin language, it was used to make the sound qua and so on. But yeah, this is a quite a common language, a quite a common sound across languages. Uvular stops, qa, usually transliterated with a Q. If you think of like country names like Iraq, now you know why it's spelled with a Q. It's Iraq, with a uvular stop at the end, rather than a velar stop. And then the last kind of stop I'd like to talk about is a glottal stop. A glottal stop is produced in your larynx. It's produced down in the glottis. You move those vocal cords so far shut that you create a blockage, and then you release them. So you're actually creating a stop with your vocal cords. We don't really have this as a sound in the English language, but we do have this sound, and we do make this sound quite a bit in English. It shows up in this interjection, uh-oh. So when you say, uh-oh, you feel there's this little hang when you say, uh-oh, right? That little hang, that little pause in uh-oh, that's the glottal stop. This also shows up in certain um, British dialects of the English language, they'll say things like bottle instead of bottle. So when they say bottle, the T there is actually pronounced using a glottal stop in that dialect of English, bottle. So that's a glottal stop, and that concludes our tour of the stop consonants. So that's great. Now you understand basically all the stop consonants that you would encounter across languages. It's going to be a lot easier for you to learn certain pronunciations now. Um, the next step is going to be fricatives. And so you see there's a lot there, and that's interesting. That means that basically at every possible place of articulation, it's possible to form some fricative. And there are languages that use those fricatives. So let's get right to it. The a fricative is a consonant which is formed by creating friction in the airflow somewhere in the mouth. It's also called a continuant. The first kind of fricative that I'd like to mention is labiodental. We've talked about these already. These are your sounds like fa and va produced with a lower lip against the top teeth. But there's also another interesting kind of fricative which is even farther in the farther front in the vocal tract, which are the bilabial fricatives. So to produce these sounds, try to pronounce a f sound or a v sound, but using only your lips. Don't use your teeth. Don't do anything. Just use only your lips. So you have fa, wa, fa, wa. These sounds, they sound a lot like fa and va, right? But they're just a little bit different. Fa and va you're producing the sounds only with your two lips, not with your teeth. So there are languages that use these sounds. For example, here's the Japanese word for, um, it's the verb that means rain is falling, and it's pronounced hurimasu. So the initial sound there, the hurimasu, 
that's an unvoiced bilabial fricative. Furimasu. So when you learn Japanese as a second language, sometimes your teacher will tell you, oh, it's some kind of sound somewhere between an F and an H. Well, now you know exactly what this sound is. It's an unvoiced bilabial fricative, furimasu. Next step back is your dental fricatives, your sounds like tha and tha in English. These are produced by putting the tongue between the teeth and then creating friction, so you get tha or tha. These dental fricatives are interesting. They're actually pretty rare across languages. It's rare to find a language that has a dental fricative like tha, tha. English is unusual as far as languages go in that English has these sounds. And indeed, when people are learning English as a second language, these are the sounds that are really hard for people. People have a lot of trouble learning how to pronounce these sounds, th and the, because these are sort of unusual sounds across languages. They're common in English, but they're rare across the languages of the world. You have it in words like thick, in words like this, that's the voiced form. Next step back is your alveolar fricatives, s and z, sa and za, tongue against the alveolar ridge, very common sounds. Next step back would be your post-alveolar fricatives, sort of just behind the alveolar ridge, sha, ja, as in ship, and vision. Ship has the unvoiced form, vision has the voiced form. Now moving farther back, we get palatal fricatives. This is something that English does not have. So remember, a palatal consonant is formed by taking the sort of front of your tongue, the middle part there, moving it straight up to touch the hard palate. The stop is cha. The fricative is xia. The voiced one would be ya. Xia, ya. Those are the palatal fricatives. They sound a lot like sh, but they're different. So there are some languages that have these palatal fricative sounds. For example, famous example is German. In German, the word for I, as in the first person pronoun, referring to me, is ich, ich, with a palatal fricative. It's not ish, it's not ich, it's ich, with a palatal fricative. Next step back is your velar fricatives. So this is where we start to get to the sounds that are sometimes colloquially described as guttural. So this, the sound of the velar fricative is ha or ga. Ha. And when you're pronouncing a velar fricative, it's important to take care that you really pronounce a velar fricative instead of a uvular or pharyngeal fricative. The velar fricative is formed by basically making the same articulatory gesture that you use to make the sound ka. So say ka, but now just try to turn that into a fricative instead of a stop. So you get ka. The vibration at the top of your tongue, the, the back of your tongue rather, is happening at the same place as the stoppage when you create the sound ka. So you have ka and the voiced form is ga. Ka and ga. So this sound is present in Russian. So here is a Russian word, khatech. This means to want in the Russian language. It's also present in Mandarin Chinese. The pronunciation of this character is h. You can feel that, if you're a Mandarin speaker, you can feel that there's some friction at the back of your tongue there when you say h. That's a velar fricative. Now we'll continue going back in the mouth, down the throat, into the so-called guttural sounds. This idea of guttural sounds, that's not really a linguistic term. That's just a sort of folk term that people use to describe these sounds. Guttural doesn't really mean anything. What these sounds are is uh, velar, uvular, pharyngeal, and glottal. So uvular fricatives. These are sounds that involve friction involving the uvula. So these are sounds like ch or ch. So say ch. You can feel there's this weird sort of vibration happening in the back of your mouth. That's your uvula vibrating around. You have ch and ch. The voice form of this, the r, is indicated with this Arabic letter rain. In the Arabic language, you have a sound rain, which is a voiced uvular fricative. Going even farther back, 
you have pharyngeal fricatives. These are produced very, very deep in the throat. These are sounds like ha and ra, ha and ra. So they're much farther back than the uvular fricatives. Again, Arabic has these sounds. It has the sound ha spelled here with this letter. It also has the voiced form ra, which is spelled with the letter ein. These are, again, these are sounds where if you're, say, learning the Arabic language as a second language, it's hard to learn how to produce these sounds. It's hard to learn how to distinguish a pharyngeal fricative from a uvular fricative. Ha versus ha. It's hard to learn how to do it. It's hard to learn how to hear it. But it's an important distinction in sounds in Arabic. You can learn it. And uh, that's how it is. Finally, at the very bottom, we have glottal fricatives. These involve simply airflow through the glottis. So this is H. This is ha. When you say ha, notice that it's only very light friction. That's just the air flowing through your vocal folds without any particular added friction. They're just completely open as if you're breathing. This is ha. Those are glottal fricatives. Good, so that's the fricatives. And that was maybe the most challenging of the rows on our IPA table here because it had the most different possible places of articulation. Notice also that some of the cells on the chart here are grayed out. What does it mean when they're grayed out? That means that that is a consonant which has been judged to be impossible to produce. So we haven't gotten to any real examples of that yet, but there are certain manners and places of articulation which are somehow incompatible. There are sounds that you just sort of, you just cannot produce. So we'll talk to that when we get to the other manners of articulation right now. We'll talk about nasals first. Nasal consonants are formed by obstructing the airflow somewhere in the vocal tract, somewhere in the mouth, while you push the um, velum backwards so that airflow goes through the nasal cavity instead of through the oral cavity. So rather you push the velum forwards. In that case, the place of articulation for a nasal consonant is wherever the airflow is obstructed in the mouth. But you should keep in mind that that obstruction of airflow in the mouth is paired with this pushing forward of the velum. So if you see this picture of the mouth here, the velum is right next to the uvula. When you push that forward, it's gonna open up the passage into the nasal cavity so that you get a nasal consonant. You get the airflow redirected through the nose. That's where it's happening. Once you move the velum forward, then the airflow can go up through the nasal cavity instead of going through the oral cavity. And you get a nasal consonant to when you are producing a nasal consonant, you can feel the vibration inside your nose by holding your fingers like this. So here are some nasal consonants. You have your bilabial nasals. This is M. This is ma. You have your labiodental nasals. These are interesting. These are produced by making the same articulatory gesture you would make to say fa or va with your lips on your teeth, fa. Now try to do that except make a nasal instead. You get ma, ma. Sounds a lot like an M. Now, this sound, you might think that this is an exotic sound, but we actually have this sound in English. Think about how you pronounce the word emphasis in English. Say it very, very slowly and pay attention to what your articulators are doing. Emphasis. Emphasis. The M there is actually a labiodental nasal, so it's emphasis. Next up is your garden variety N, your alveolar nasal. Just about every language has an alveolar nasal. Tip of the tongue against the alveolar ridge, velum moves forward to create that nasal airflow. Next up is the palatal nasal. This is produced, again, by taking the middle part of the tongue, moving it up to the hard palate, and making a nasal. We don't have this in English, but you do have it in other languages, for example, Spanish. This sound is going to be ña, ña. So you create that palatal motion, make it nasal, you get ña, as in the Spanish word año, 
spelled with the enye. Next one is quite interesting. Velar nasal. A velar nasal. This is a sound that exists in English. It is in fact a phoneme in English, and you'll understand what that means once we get to phonology. So this is actually an important sound in English, although we don't really write it consistently using our writing system. The velar nasal is formed by moving your mouth as if you're going to pronounce a velar sound, so like ka or ga. Try to do that, but make a nasal instead. You get nga, nga, nga. This sound is found quite commonly in English, in words like king. When you say king, the last sound there is a velar nasal. We spell that with an ng in English, but it's only one sound. You don't usually say king, in some dialects you might, but in many dialects of American English, it's just one sound, king. And in a word like think, feel where your articulators are going when you say the nasal sound in think. It's not thin, it's, it's not an alveolar nasal, it's a velar nasal, it's an eng, eng at the back there, think. That's a velar nasal. Now, in English, we have velar nasals, but we only have them at the ends of consonants. So we only have them rather at the ends of syllables. In other languages, you can get that same velar nasal actually at the beginnings of words. So for example, in the Tagalog language, you have a word like nipping, where the initial sound is actually a velar nasal. Another example would be in Vietnamese, the common surname spelled N-G-U-Y-E-N. -E the N-G at the beginning there spells the velar nasal, so the name is pronounced Nguyen. That's nasals. And now we'll go into trills and flaps. These are sort of more interesting manners of articulation. They're not simple stops, nasals, or fricatives. These are going to be some things that we really don't have in English, although you'll see we actually have them to a surprising degree. So trills and flaps, these involve basically make ways of making your tongue vibrate over and over again, sort of bouncing over and over again against an articulator. A trill is formed by causing an articulator to bounce up and down repeatedly at some point in your mouth. So this is your sounds like r, your rolled r as it's called. That's really a trill, r. You are making your tongue vibrate up and down in very many times. That's a trill. A flap is the same thing except you only vibrate once. So you're taking your tongue and you're making it just sort of bounce against an articulator just one time. So an example of this would be in Spanish. There's a sound r, as in the sound carro, which means car. That is a voiced alveolar trill, carro. You hear that the r is bouncing, it's vibrating multiple times when you say carro. On the other hand, you have a word like caro, which means face. Caro, with a single R in the spelling there. But notice that the IPA symbol for the flap is this sort of funny R. It's this funny R that is uh, not a complete R. The complete R in IPA indicates the trill, r. So caro in Spanish just has the flap. There's only one bounce, caro. It means face. We also have flaps like this in English. We don't have trills in English, but we have flaps. In a word like kitty, as pronounced in American English, if you say this slowly, kitty, you'll feel that you're not fully stopping and articulating that unvoiced alveolar stop kitty. Rather, you're producing an unvoiced alveolar flap, kitty. There's just a little bounce thing. Or in many cases, it's actually a voiced alveolar stop, kitty. Or in a word like atom, you have a flap there. You have a, the funny R indicates the flap in atom. Another interesting kind of trill, which you see in many different languages, but not in English, is a uvular trill. A uvular trill is something that sounds a lot like an alveolar trill. It sounds a lot like the r, but it is produced by vibrating the uvula rather than the tip of the tongue on the alveolar ridge. So this happens in many languages. In many languages, this uvular trill actually is what is indicated by the letter R. In the IPA, the uvular trill is indicated with a capital R. 
Some examples would be in French. In French, as spoken in France, the letter R spells the sound not R like in English and not R like in Spanish, but rather the uvular trill R. I need to take some water before I say that. <clears throat> fromage. You hear there's a trill there, fromage. The trill is actually produced in the uvula. This is also famously present in German. So this is the verb to smoke in German, pronounced rauchen, rauchen. There's a trill at the beginning with the R produced at the uvula. Uh, modern Hebrew also has this uvular trill spelled by uh, the equivalent of the letter R. So by the way, this is where we start to see consonants which are impossible. So like there's no velar trill. Why is there no velar trill? Because there's no way to make your the back of your tongue sort of bounce against the velum in the same way that you can make the uvula bounce around or that you can make the tip of your tongue bounce around. So it's actually impossible to articulate any kind of velar trill. And so that cell in this table is blocked out. So those are your trap, your uh, taps, flaps, and trills. Next up, we're going to look at approximants. We're going to start looking now at consonants that do not involve any kind of stoppage or any kind of friction in the airflow. Approximants are consonants that are formed by constricting airflow within your vocal tract, but not creating friction. So you don't completely stop up the airflow, you don't create friction, you just create a sort of mild blockage. The air flows through, creating a sound which is modified, but which doesn't involve any friction or stopping. And these are also called glides, and they're also called liquids, because there's something maybe liquid-seeming about these sounds. So and a big example of this is the sound which is spelled by the English letter R in the International Phonetic Alphabet that corresponds to this upside down R. So this is, you should keep in mind, this R, the English sound R does not correspond to the International Phonetic Alphabet symbol R. The English sound, which is spelled by the English letter R, corresponds to the sound which is written in IPA with the upside down R. This upside down R indicates the sound R, that we have in English. A, that is an alveolar approximate. Again, like I noted with the dentals, the, the dentals are sounds which are rare across languages. They're common in English, but they're rare across languages. Similarly, this alveolar approximant, er, as in car, that we have in English, this is a very unusual sound across languages. And in fact, again, if you're learning English as a second language, this sound is hard to learn how to pronounce. This r sound is sort of weird. And it's one of the things that makes English odd as far as languages go. So that's the alveolar approximant. The next one, next approximant, is the palatal approximant. That is just y. That's the sound spelled by a y in English, and it's spelled with a j in the International Phonetic Alphabet. Y, 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 y. So those are approximants. The last thing we're gonna look at is lateral approximants. These are a special kind of approximant. Remember, approximate means there's no kind of friction or blockage during the pronunciation of these sounds. A lateral approximant is formed by constricting the airflow without creating friction, such that the air flows around the sides of the tongue. So you're creating a stop it, you're creating an obstacle within your vocal tract and the air is flowing around that obstacle on both sides. The most common example of a lateral approximant is what's spelled with the English letter L and the IPA symbol L. So when you say la, la, you can hear there's no friction. La, you can hear that it's voiced. La, you can feel that it is not nasal. La. What's going on there is that you're sticking the tip of your tongue up to your alveolar ridge, so it's an alveolar lateral approximate. Sticking the tip of your tongue up to your lateral ridge, the air is flowing around it smoothly. So you have la, that's what an L is. 
You also sometimes have a palatal lateral approximant, which is formed by, again, making that palatal movement, move the center of your tongue up to your hard palate. Ya, ya. So there's some dialects of Spanish where you have this sound. For example, in Spain and in Bolivia, a word like gallo, uh, meaning rooster, is that LL is pronounced with a palatal lateral approximant gallo. And that's why, it's, that's why it's spelled with the two L's, because it was originally always pronounced as the palatal lateral approximate. Although in most dialects of Spanish nowadays, it's just pronounced as a simple palatal approximate or even as a palatal fricative. So you get gallo or gallo. But in Spain and in some areas of South America, it's still pronounced gallo with the palatal lateral approximate. So in other dialects, you get that palatal fricative gaijo. Another example of this palatal lateral approximant is what's spelled with a GL in Italian, famiglia, famiglia. So we're still not quite done, although we are done with the chart. There is a certain special kind of consonant called affricate which exists but doesn't have a special place on the chart, and I'll explain why. An affricate is a special sort of compound consonant, which consists of a stop immediately followed by a fricative. So some examples are the sound j, like in the English word judge. That is a d followed by a j. So that is a voiced alveolar stop d followed by a voiced post alveolar fricative j. Put them together, d j. J, j, and you get the affricate, judge. The unvoiced form would be ch, as in church. So that's a t followed by a sh, as in chin.